My guest today is Rocky Latka. Rocky, how are you? Very good. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you. It's been too long. It has. Uh, except for last week when we saw each other. Well, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but until then, it was too long. I, I, uh, in fact, I think the last time you were on my show, which was years ago, that was like two jobs ago. What's, what are you doing for a living these days? Well, these days I work for a company called Zebia, and we do uh, cloud modernization work primarily helping folks get into Azure and mm -hmm. GitHub. and So either modernizing their applications or modernizing their uh, development process and, and you know, using uh, GitHub and all the actions and all the cool stuff that's there. All right. So you're doing uh, implementation and you're doing design and architecture and all sorts of things like that. An awful lot of what we do is the high-level consulting pieces of that puzzle. Um, and then we have other folks inside of Zebia that do the kind of scaled implementation if when that becomes appropriate. So All right. let's talk high level because you just gave a talk uh, on uh, what was your talk um, at DevSum here. My talk yeah. is on on architecture yeah. and uh, really focusing on something that I've been interested in and talking about for a very long time, which is uh, how to build effective distributed systems and. Um, of course, we started out with uh, you know, just running everything on one computer and then yeah. client server of different flavors. Um, and now the, the uh, oh, and don't forget about service-oriented architecture. Uh, right. uh, That's still kind of important. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe. And, and of course, now microservices. Yeah. And so, um, That's why I say that microservices is kind of a, uh, an implementation of SOA. I would like to think so, um, and, and that's how I talk about it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that so many people um, approached SOA as something completely different, hmm. um, you know, what, 12, 14 years ago, um, that I, I think that's part of why SOA failed, is because uh, folks approached it with this idea of creating a master document, um, you know, and, and figuring out, oh, well, if, here, here's the master document for customer. And, and what we will do is pass this around um, from service to service. Ah, I see. And uh, ra rather than you know, what we think of today as microservices and, and what I think we should have been doing you know, back then, which is to, all you do is say, you know, I, I've got a service. I will tell you what my service needs hmm. um, you know, in, in a contract of some sort, right? But, you, but you, you, you have to give me this, and I will give you something in return. And it isn't this master document thing. It's it's unique to my service because ah, you know, every every service defines its input and its output. Oh, this is this is interesting. We're sort of talking about something that I wasn't planning to talk about, but no, I no, think no. The, but I think the distinction that I'm hearing, <laughs> which I hadn't heard before, is that with microservices, it's the it's the service itself that defines what that contract looked like, and with SOA, maybe it's the the document is defined in advance, and then the services the consumer have to adhere. To somebody else's document. I think that's what I heard you say. Pretty much. Yeah, and, that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't it, thought of it that way. And it's not universal, but that there were a lot of very large consulting companies back in the day that, mm -hmm. that drove this idea because they had tooling or consulting services or whatever that where they could make money off this master document <laughs> it was, idea. It was the golden and, hammer uh, thing. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> All right, but there's uh, so it's evolving, and I think the let's get to, to the talk that you did. Um, at DevSum, which is, uh, I haven't know. I know the answer to this is, <laughs> how do I implement an enterprise architecture for a distributed system? And I, I already know the answer is, it depends. Oh, of course it depends. <laughs> I, I've been in consulting a long time, <laughs> my the friend. The universal <laughs> consulting answer, exactly. The UCA, if you will. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what does it depend on, and what are the options? Well, I think that you know when I look at this, if you're coming from a brownfield which most people are. Brownfield means uh, the application exists already. You've already got probably not just one, maybe hundreds of applications, and you're saying, I, I want to move to the cloud. Um, and in that case, you actually have to step back and look at your application portfolio. And um, step one in a lot of cases is identifying what is it that you actually have today? Where does it run? Uh, is it important to the business? What kind of technical debt or liability does it have? Um, would it benefit from going to the cloud? All the all sorts of things, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and, and this is all critical. And, and companies that I've worked with 
have discovered ancient VB6 apps that they had forgotten about, but, sure. but um, still get used once a quarter or once a year, and without them, the business can't function. Yeah, sometimes Excel. Oh, oh sometimes <laughs> Excel or an Access. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, um, and uh, one in particular, it, oh, well, and then the next step is, okay, find the source code, make sure you have all the things necessary to, mm -hmm. to think about migrating. Uh, one of them did not have the source code I've because the uh, the developer that wrote the thing had left, retired long ago. Their PC had been recycled, and sure. the source code was there, on there was that one the, PC. The people didn't use source yeah. controls yeah, right. twenty years ago. Yep, it yep. wasn't common. So, uh, so what you come out with, though, at the end of this, hopefully, is a catalog of all of your uh, software assets. And you know then which ones have high business value, low business value, which ones have uh, high tech debt or low tech debt relevant yeah. or relative to a migration process. So maybe just prioritizing which and ones we you need to do first, which ones do we not need to do at all maybe. It, well, yeah, and some of them you might, um, you know, 20 years or, or 30 years might have gone by since some of these things were created. Well, today you might be able to find a software as a service vendor that does the thing that you had to write by yourself 20 years ago. Ah, yeah. Right, so sometimes you're like, oh yeah, we don't need to migrate this at all because we can just go buy it off the shelf or we can you know, get a software, a cloud-based vendor. Um, other things will just keep limping along, we'll lift and shift them into a virtual machine in the cloud, okay. um, which doesn't really gain us anything other than arguably we're in the cloud. Um, yeah, and other things we're going to rewrite or, or modernize in some way to actually make them either somewhat cloud native or entirely cloud native. Okay, uh, just define that word, cloud native. Well, I think, and, and I, I, I was derisive already about the whole lift and shift thing, right? Where you, sure. My software today runs on a server and I can take it out of my server in my data center and I can run it in some cloud vendor's virtual machine. Sure. Uh, all, you, all you bought is you don't have to buy and maintain the hardware that's, anymore. That's right. I, but I still have to maintain the operating system right. and security patches, all the things. Um, and so I really didn't gain Not anything substantial. Um, but yeah, so when I think about cloud native, um, I actually think about the 12 factors, uh, 12factor.net. Um, it's a, a website that has been around now for quite a long time that has 12, what I think of as patterns that if you follow these patterns, then your software will likely take full advantage of what the cloud has to offer in terms of elasticity and lower cost, mm -hmm. maintainability. Um, and, and these patterns have to do with how your application um, starts up, how it shuts down, uh, how it manages configuration, um, how it manages memory, um, hmm. how you manage your source code, so it has to do with your DevOps pipeline. It's, so these are not coding patterns. Uh, these are, are behavioral patterns. Okay. Um, that, uh, it, and, and what I find interesting is if you look at the evolution of .NET, for example, from the old .NET framework to modern cross-platform .NET, mm -hmm. uh, as that occurred, many of these patterns got incorporated into modern .NET. Okay. So like the entire configuration subsystem that existed in the old .NET framework is different now, and the new one supports the patterns and practices that are part of the 12-factor model. Okay, so uh, help me with the 12-factor model. This is a, uh, the, uh, do I apply all 12 factors or is it an o option to choose the one that's appropriate for my application? Well here I think we come to a greenfield versus brownfield you know, okay. again, so brownfield being where you've got apps and okay. greenfield where I get to start from scratch right. in that rare and precious case. <laughs> yeah, you've got a lot more <laughs> options if you're building um, everything from scratch. So if I'm building it from scratch, I would definitely try to achieve all 12. Okay. Absolutely. Um, if I'm approaching it where I've got an existing app that I really need to get into the cloud and I, I can't just lift and shift because that's not going to gain me what I want out mm -hmm. of the cloud, um, then... Yeah, there's a subset. Um, I, I used to work with a, a, a fellow that came up with this idea of what he called the fast five. So out of those 12, there are five factors that... Is it always the same five? It is. Oh. And if you can okay. achieve those five, um, you know, then you're, you're able to... Um, you're, you're not fully cloud native, but okay. you're 
cloud capable Those maybe the five is most a important good ones. Let's, let's phrase. Go through them. Oh yeah, now you're gonna tax oh, ta tax my memory <laughs> here, right? Um, and so yeah, one of them is configuration, and so you have you have to uh, um, adopt a cloud-based configuration model, and so the old .NET approach of having a, an app.config or you know, that type of thing yeah. really does not work in the cloud world. Um, the cloud world assumes that your configuration uh, is going to come from environment variables or some external configuration store. Right, like Key Vault, for example. Something like, yep. And, and so that way, your code um, at no level has hard-coded configuration. Right. And um, so your code can run in a dev environment and it will get dev configuration, and it will mm -hmm. run in a production environment, and it gets production configuration. Okay. But the configuration is externalized. Mm -hmm. yeah, and more secure if it's a, something like a password or a connection. Yeah, server. right, you'd hope so anyway, <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, you know, modern cloud infrastructure has great ways to secure those things. Okay. Uh, you were on the show a while ago talking about this open source framework that you developed over the last two decades or so. Does that play into this um, idea of ref, uh, you know, uh, redesigning, making these applications cloud native? I think it can. Mm -hmm. you know, and the, the way that I think it can is if, if you're already using, um, so let me put it this way, CSLA. That's um, the open source framework, that, that's CSLA. The open, okay. open source framework. Um, supports an architecture that really focuses on separation of concerns. Mm -hmm. And so keeping your presentation code separate from your business logic, separate from your data access code. Okay. And which is a good practice always. That's been true for decades. I it it has. I don't know if we've always done that, but we've always known we should do that. Uh, and, you know, and, but it's hard because the, uh, you know, let, let's just pick on Microsoft because, you know, we're Microsoft Please, folks ahead. here. Sure, why not? Um, <laughs> you know, it's hard because the tooling inside of, um, VB, Windows Forms, WPF, Web Forms, er, everything, all the way up through Blazor today, okay. um, makes it really easy to create these wonderful user experiences. And where's the easiest place to put any sort of code? Uh, yeah, I, it's, I, it's, I'm, I'm thinking of the early demos of .NET where they would just drag a, a data set yeah. onto a form. Yep. And now you've got database code inside of your form, which is Ab not separation Absolutely, of right, right. Yep, the, the tooling, um, just doesn't guide you down a path of, of separation of concerns right. or long-term success. And the, the real, uh, I guess, niche that I've tried to fill with the open source framework with CSLA is to elevate the concept of business logic to the same level as a UI framework or a data access tool. Hmm, okay. So you think we've got these fantastic ADO.net or Entity Framework or you know, different tools to talk to databases. And we've got all of this fantastic UI, you know, whether you Razor Pages or Blazor or uh, you know, Maui, whatever, to create user experiences. Um, but there isn't a, a place that helps you create maintainable, repeatable uh, business logic. Hmm, okay, and, and that's, that's where CSLA steps in. And that is where CSLA steps in. And so I'm, I'm giving all this background uh, with the intent of saying that um, what really makes modernization hard for most folks is that their business logic is buried in the UI, mm. right? Some, some people have it buried in stored procedures, right. uh, which arguably is better, maybe, um, but it has its own set of drawbacks. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, if your business logic is in your, your controller or if it's in your button click events, um, uh, it's hard to test know. that button click event it, because it, you have to load the form to test it. it. It is. It's hard to test. And then when you say, well, I want to I shift from being a monolithic WPF app to being uh, cloud-based, um, yeah. now you know, you're saying, okay, I want part of my app to run in services in the cloud. Yeah. And so now you've got this monumental task of teasing out the oh. business logic that's buried in the UI sure. um, so you can actually pull it out into services. Yeah, there's a lot of and even if you want to just switch to a, a web-based app uh, oh, versus right. a, a Windows form app or a WPF app, it, it's uh, that makes that hard as well. Intractable. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse. I know, but uh, yeah, separation no, of it's, concerns it's, <laughs> alleviates yeah. a lot of those problems. 
and, and so this the is, yeah. yeah and so this is where csla in my mind has always been the focus is to say yes there should be a completely separate place for your business logic so you could in theory at least rip off your presentation layer and slap on a completely new one mm -hmm. and your business logic changes little or not at all and your data access logic which is even further down the stack doesn't change and so you get the you know and so then you translate this into moving from uh, let's say a, an older style WPF app that's talking directly to a database and you say oh no we're gonna go cloud native we're gonna set up an app server with some microservices and um, this becomes a whole lot easier um, if you already had your business logic separated right. um, if you don't which most people don't then here's a great opportunity because you're already basically going to have to rewrite a lot of your code to tease out that logic mm. uh, now is your opportunity to look at um, some sort of um, structure for your business logic uh, may, might be CSLA it might be something else you know it's all good by me the point is that you know, don't just randomly do it think about it and and do it in in a intentional way that's going to help you you know these enterprise apps live for 10 15 20 years and right. Yeah, you know, so you, this idea that you just, we're in a hurry, which we always are. <laughs> under, we, have, we have no idea that this is going to be oh, we're like under running deadlines, this for 20 years. But I, I assume. We, just in, need, we, need it by, we know we need it by Tuesday. That's the. That, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I call that the pit of success, <laughs> right? You, you write an app. Uh, you, you were told by the stakeholder, yeah, we just need, it's a, it's a stop gap. We're, we're migrating from this one enterprise system to this other enterprise system. It's a two-year migration. We just need this for a two-year stopgap. <laughs> and 20 years later, the company is still running on this stopgap. You know? <laughs> um, so I guess my, my, uh, I, over my career, I've learned to treat everything as though it's uh, mission critical. T tell me about just the process of, uh, you know, what kind of questions are you asking when you come into a client that wants to migrate something and make it more cloud ready? What kind of things do you need to know about the application? Well, there's two pieces. One is what's the business driver for it? Okay. Right. Why, what, what's their pain that they're feeling right now? Is it because it doesn't scale? Is it because the uh, um, CTO went golfing with somebody from a uh, and they were sold on a on a cloud vendor or uh, that, that, that's cynical. I'm sorry. No, but, I, that, uh, but yeah, there's truth to that, right? Uh, they read um, the magazine article in the airplane, came back and said Kubernetes. We got to do Kubernetes. Got to do Kubernetes. <laughs> um, you know, but but usually there is a business driver right. somewhere behind this, right? It's too slow, or we're we're worried that our competitors are going to um, produce something better than us and leapfrog us, like like uh, Uber and Lyft have done with taxis. Right. Um, it, there's a lot of examples. Then you start looking at the existing technology and say, okay, um, you know, how is this thing built? Um, how intertwined is the code base? Um, or, or how clean are the separation of concerns in the existing code base, uh, which is a spectrum, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, you know, depending on the business drivers and what we're trying to gain, lift and shift might be a good enough answer. Okay. Right? Just getting out of my own data center into the cloud because I get a lot of, um, even though I'm probably not going to save any money per se, but I, I'm able to tap into some of the fault tolerance and other features that... Mm -hmm something like an Azure provides that are, I might have in my data center, but a lot of us don't. Right. Right. Um, uh, and then it also you know, might be step one. And that might you be step might, one. You might tease out the separations of concerns yep. later on. And, and, but you know, a lot of times what it amounts to is, is it's like we're, we, we can't move fast enough because in order to um, change some of our code, we have to rebuild the entire app. Mm -hmm. And, Often, though, what I find is that most of the app isn't changing very fast, hmm. right? I mean, you look at an enterprise app, they're usually big, right? They're, sure. they're hundreds or thousands of screens. And most of them probably haven't changed for a decade and won't change for another decade. So you need to figure out what are the parts that need to be flexible. Exactly. And okay. there's no sense throwing money at creating microservices for maintenance screens that get run once a year. And yeah. you know what I mean? But there's other parts of the app that um, are causing us pain because there's maybe regulatory changes that are happening on a regular basis. 
and we need to be able to uh, uh, respond to those or pricing changes or you know, different things like that, pulling those pieces of logic out into a separate service um, can really gain you a lot in some cases because now that becomes something you can maintain in a much more agile way, mm -hmm. um, even though the you know ninety percent of your code is still the monolith. Okay, you said there were two reasons. I think one was the um, uh, what's the business driver. Is the second one prioritizing in this way, or is it another one? Oh, the, the second one is really a tech drivers. You know, uh, maybe, maybe your your uh, and, and this in my career has been something that's driven change m numerous times, right? Where a platform just goes, effectively goes away, like Foxpro. Um, I'm an old Foxpro guy myself. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm, I have a fondness for it still. I, you know, <laughs> I know so many people like that, and, um, and this was early in my consulting career. Um, why we rewrote a lot of Foxpro apps into VB and then into .NET because mm -hmm. Foxpro effectively went away. Right. And, uh, you know, now we're looking at, and I, you know, you, Microsoft is committed to maintaining the .NET framework for a very, very long time, but maintaining and, and innovating are two different things, sure. right? And so I, th I think in the, in the .NET space, we're in a similar spot where if you're targeting and writing your code against the .NET framework, over time, you need a strategy to get to modern .NET. And, uh, you know, so that too is a tech driver that, you know, separate from a business driver. Um, I mean, they're intertwined, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you have to have a strategy over the next several years, maybe a decade, right? Eventually, it's going to become very difficult to find people willing to work in the increasingly older .NET framework when you could be working in modern .NET. Uh, that's a good point. Those are, there are not a lot of uh, uh, Foxport developers out there uh, relative to the number of C-sharp developers or Java developers right. or Node, Python, mm -hmm. some of these more popular modern languages. Uh, and uh, uh, so they become expensive. That's, <laughs> yep. And, and, you know, and there are companies that pay that, right? And, and there are companies, too, that, um, you know, especially out just offshore, um, you've, you've got a massive COBOL code base. Well, there are people that will maintain that for you for yeah. a price. Um, yeah. yeah. But, then, but then also you're not uh, taking advantage of the uh, modern languages are, are evolving and they, they have every year C Sharp has new features added to it. Well, right. nobody's adding anything to COBOL as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I actually don't know. <laughs> it's my guess. It's probably a valid assumption. Uh, we're just about at time. Is there anything we haven't covered, I think, that's really critical to this? I know you could talk about it for a long time. No, I, I think you know, we've covered a lot of ground and uh, yeah, you know, I, I just think that all of this is quite exciting. Um, you know, I, part of the attraction to me, um, e even with as much you know, gray hair as I guess I have now, uh, of being in, in our industry is that it doesn't stay the same. Yes. And, um, and I think it attracts people that want to continue to learn and want to continue to innovate and uh, and the exciting thing is that the technology allows us to do that, and there are business drivers that enable it as well, right? Yeah. The, the, and, and, the, and that's important because those are usually the people that write the checks. Correct. Um, and, technology uh, is fun, but business pays the bills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, it's, and so, um, I, I guess in short, I, I find this all exciting, right? This move to the cloud, whether that be Kubernetes or, or other type of cloud-based fabrics, um, and the uh, capabilities that exist right now today that I dreamt about and I'm sure a lot of people did 15 or 20 years ago it's like oh I wish it I wish that we had this well <laughs> in a lot of ways we do today right and of course now you start modernizing your software into the stuff of today and you're like man I wish I I wish it did this mm -hmm. well the cool thing is 15 years from now, it probably is going to do this too, you know? Wow, that is, doesn't mean no good, but it, <laughs> some no, of our but listeners maybe. it's fun, it's fun. <laughs> Rocky, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure. Likewise, thank you. It amazes me how many friends I have made over my career working in technology. It's fantastic.